All right, let's go ahead and jump into the issue triage. I see. Uh, thanks, Alvaro, for adding the link. So we're at 3074. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this one uh, about node pull method. Okay. So it seems like this one we're still kind of collecting information. Uh, what would we say is the next steps on this one? I'm, I haven't heard of a harbor before. Yeah, I was very confused. But what what he means with that? But I'm I'm guessing maybe you know English is not the first language and. Harbor is how they translate maybe registry or something like that, but mm. that, that's my guess. But sure, yeah. Do we know? Uh, so obviously, we are all a bit familiar with like the OpenShift cluster pull secret, and like this is how an OpenShift environment is configured to enable the pull method. Does I assume that Kubernetes has a similar facility to? basically store the uh, like registry pull secret configuration. Uh, although OpenShift is, the, is OpenShift pull secrets, is that kind of like an OpenShift thing or is that also used on Kubernetes? I'm afraid I don't uh, know that for sure. I think that to me, that might be the next step is if we take a look and see if uh, do a, a quick uh, Google search for Kubernetes pull secret. And uh, there, I assume there might be some documentation for that. And uh, if we uh, <clears throat> if we link to that, it could be uh, the kind of information they're looking for. Well, as I'm assuming that their containers can connect to this harbor successfully. If not, then you know. Not quite sure what they're expecting, but yeah. So I mean, I guess that would be the <clears throat> that would be maybe the next question. Like, uh, can you? I'm just gonna. Uh, For me, this is the initial question. If they can, if they can use this registry for regular container-based workloads, it should work for our our use case. Oops. So we'll try that and see what we can what we can glean from that. Um, any other comments that anyone would want to put on this one? It seems to me we're just still, still excuse me, still in the uh, information gathering phase on this one. Okay, so that was thirty seventy four. And I'm looking for it in the list. So there's two two uh, additional issues above that. Uh, so we have a data import cron error. Yeah, it looks like they're using a URL uh, HTTP source. Okay. And that's yeah. uh, something we don't support. But we could, oh, okay. Nice. Perfect comment on this one. <clears throat> Thank you, Alvaro. OK, <clears throat> so I say nothing further needed on this one at the moment. And finally, 
our PM lists are maintained with Bazel DNF in three different config files. Okay. Yeah, that's the guy that's trying to get CDI to work on um, um, the Z platform. Okay. Is this something that uh, do you think the document, the documentation could be done for this? Is it? Uh, that's a very good question. I'm not even I sure think, how it works. So. I think there's a. I think there's a interesting discussion in the PR. Uh, this person is not using the builder for some reason like they're doing laptop all the way uh, but i didn't understand why i think uh, michael pointed it out Okay, cool. So we have a PR, uh, we have some attention on the PR. So that's great to see. Um, so in terms of triage, it seems that the process is working well with this, uh, uh, with this PR. Is there any uh, issues technical or otherwise that we would want to bring up in this forum regarding this? Okay. All right. So I think that is well on its way also. Um, any other issues that we want to go back and revisit? Is there anything <clears throat> old that we might need to close, um, Alvaro, in your review? Um, anything that maybe we've asked for some details or given someone a little bit more time to respond before closing an issue that we should clean up? Mm, yeah, like there's several issues that are waiting for response. So I, I will need to review again. Okay. Uh, but yeah, for sure, if we can spend some time like uh, going back to some of these old uh, issues, uh, it will probably be helpful. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to do that in this forum <clears throat> if there's no other pressing uh, technical discussion, which I would prioritize. Um, so, uh, for example, this one, uh, the first one, is the only one that we have uh, written. Okay. And I was taking a look earlier today. Um, I wasn't too sure what to answer the la to the last uh, user that commented. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's really no nothing in the issue. Uploading large images. Okay, so basically, is this the issue where <clears throat> the upload takes longer than the token lifespan? Yeah. Just reviewing this. Does the Nginx proxy have request buffering? Okay, so it's still stale. We have, um, when's the last time we actually had some commentary from, is this from the submitter? No, this is somebody new and it seems like maybe a different question. Okay, so last comments really back in September.
<clears throat> All right, so we'll take care. We'll do that one. We'll see if it triggers any further discussion. Um, any other ones that you'd want to take a look at um, based on your earlier review? So maybe the read write one spot for the data volumes. Um, I don't know if we had some new information about that or if we decided to move forward on implementing that. We've had a question about it on inside Red Hat, um, but I, no follow up, just a curiosity, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it seems on the one hand that just as uh, David Vossel suggests, like just allowing that access mode to pass validation um, could be a pretty simple PR. Um, whether we want to actually test a bunch of flows with that, though, I don't know. But I think if we do allow it to pass validation, then we, we owe some testing. And I'm just not sure that that's... On the one hand, it's like, okay, Kubernetes introduced a new capability that's highly relevant for what we do. So maybe we should follow it. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it's not particularly interesting for our use cases. So do we really want to invest the extra time testing the flows without someone specifically asking for it? Any thoughts from the maintainer side on that? Yeah, I mean, I think we should definitely test the the flows that use pods. I mean, obviously, I don't think for the smart cloning stuff we have to test it because, well, although we do use pods there sometimes if um, if you have to, ex the target is bigger. So, I, yeah, I mean... Yeah, I kind of wonder if there's a way to parameterize just a few of the existing read write once tests. Um, and, you know, it's like do an iteration with read write once pod just to see if everything flows together correctly. I can't imagine there being any, uh, any like really severe gotchas, but it might tickle a weird assumption that we made or something somewhere. Yeah, I think the only like potentially weird interaction is when we do the um uh import pod like we we um first try to import without using scratch base and then mm. delete the pod and then recreate the pod. Sure. Um, I think that's the only like potential time where there's like contention. Um, but I'm not even yeah. sure that it's true. Well, we should use ephemeral volumes anyways. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to, yeah, so I'm trying to recall on that one, uh, on the ephemeral volume question. Uh, well, it would still be a different pod. I mean, unless we always create the, um, the scratch space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I, I think that's orthogonal in my mind because I don't really understand. Like it's still that's a totally different question. Do we want to allocate unconditionally additional storage, um, even if we might not need it? Are there a substantial number of use cases that we're saving the uh, extra pod, and therefore to justify the complexity of the restart, or do we want to just always have scratch space? I, I think the number of times we don't have scratch space is very limited. I think it's only like one or two flows and the rest you always have scratch space. So mm -hmm. it, it might are... make sense to just not do it and just do the ephemeral volume and be done with it whole way. So what are the no scratch space? Can we can we remind ourselves of that? Is it does it have to be an HTTP raw import or can it be a QCOW too? I can't. Michael, you worked in that area on the streaming. Yeah. It, so I think I think although if you you know count the different methods we support, there are a few. But I think the most common, um, like you can import a. Um, 
the QCOW to without scratch space. Mm -hmm. With as yeah, as long as there's no authentication, I think maybe yeah, there are a couple. Um, yeah, the HTTP server has to support the range requests or, or whatever, and no authentication. I think there's maybe some other I'm gotcha, kidding. but I think most of them. Wall. The what? Compress raw XZ. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, the, so again, it, just straight QCOW two. It, it's fine. It's when you get into like the compressed stuff where um, you need scratch space. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I mean, that's definitely. We should probably have an issue to mm -hmm. a separate issue to discuss whether we want to do that uh, and just switch to always using scratch space um you know do we think that the simplification we're going to get from that is enough i know that it's going to make a few people happy who who don't like to see the data volume temporarily go into a transient error state and then recover from that um so i know that we've had some issues with that but i mean other than that it'll make ovio happy because he doesn't have to deal with the exit code two thing anymore because that's also yeah that's definitely good, right right yeah right so that's i mean those are the some of the benefits uh however it's really old code that has been reliable so do we want to uh do we want to play with fire is the other sort of side of that coin um but yeah in any case i think that's orthogonal to this actual issue which is again do we want to just uh, enable the flows for read write once pod, um, even though we haven't really been. I mean, this ask from David is uh, is obviously about the kubevert CSI driver. We could no. Mm -hmm. This this is purely do we support read write once pod in a data volume? Yeah, I th but we, I think we got that... a VM disk that's read write once pod. Mm -hmm. that's it. I'm not sure how this relates to the Cooper C side driver. We could give this feature and have like a uh, like a smoke te smoke test that creates a you know clone upload import, mm -hmm. but then we have to include a note that you know if thing things get more complex might be issues. You know, un yeah. Unless we change our whole test suite to parameterize uh, read write once with uh, read write once pod, then we don't have like full confidence. Mm -hmm. So maybe somewhere in the middle is just have some smoke tests. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be reasonable, um, you know, again, and then if, if people do encounter issues, you know, we can beef up the the testing of it. I don't suggest that we change the um, the storage profiles uh, to prefer this over read write once. Um, I guess the other question that I have is, um, since this is a new access mode, how well is it supported by uh, CSI drivers around, for example? Is it as universally supported as read write once? That, um, that's, a, that's a good question. We um... I'm I'm not sure we have lanes with storage that can support this, or maybe this is not so much an implementation on the CSI level, but more of a Kubernetes uh, webhook. I, I think it's a Kubernetes level thing because I don't remember seeing read write once pod in the uh, capabilities list for CSI drivers. I suppose it's more related to how permissive the Kubernetes scheduler is. I remember that some Dell drivers explicitly mention read write once pod as supported, and I always found it weird that they needed to mention it mm -hmm. when they already allow all the others. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, um, we can just if if everybody's on board, we could just uh, implement the suggestion by David and add some smoke tests. I think one, one thing. 
I think one thing that could be interesting is if somebody took this and uh, made a PR that just converted read write once to read write once pod in the relevant, uh, like basically added this val validation relaxing code that David suggests. And then uh, in a draft PR uh, change, like pretty much all the tests to use read write once pod and see if we get, um, if it comes out clean just as a, as a information gathering exercise. And if, if the tests are completely, um, you know, uh, indifferent to that change, then that would lend us some confidence. We probably still should in the final PR have some smoke tests, but um, if it works generally. You could create a uh, mutating webhook that changes all read write once to read write once pod. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. So I think that that would be a, uh, a good sort of exploratory next step. Um, I'm just going to add a little comment. So uh, I think that was, that summarizes the discussion that we just had. Uh, let's pop back out of this issue unless there are any other comments about it. And I'll throw it out here to see are there any other issues we should look at or has anyone added another topic to the uh, to the agenda? I added the uh, six storage issues in Kubert Kubert. Maybe oh, we great. Can... I only have the one for now, but I was going to keep looking more. Okay. VM export download, remove export, even if it was not able to download. I think we discussed it this week. This is just yeah. a defined behavior. Exactly. So uh, I don't know, but I think that's consistent with the command, with the download. And if you want to like try again, you, just, you can just rerun the same command. And if you want to, to keep the BM export object to debug, you can just add the, the flag. So I'm not sure we should change this behavior. Where is the, in this uh, series of, uh, this output, I'm not seeing the failure. Like, how are they triggering the failure? Like, if they just control C the download or something. Yeah. Uh, no, it's uh, the last um, like debug message. Uh, it says detected more than one uh, volume. So, yeah, when oh, there's okay. more than one volume, you need to specify the volume name with a flag. Okay, so for me, if there's a command usage error, um, I feel like 
I honestly feel like it should, if the command is exiting with an error because it refused to try anything, it probably shouldn't also delete it, I would say. I mean, I think the in this case, the correct behavior, you ask for a download, then a delete. And we said, I'm not even going to try to download, but I'll still happily delete. To me, that's uh, the command chose not to, it chose to abort, but it still did some other stuff. I think that in, if the case was that they didn't, want to download or retry then they would just use it do we have like we have a vm export ctl vm export delete or you just delete the export object yeah or... like we have the the delete command but in this case uh it's just on garbage collection at the end of the download mm -hmm. yeah i might mm -hmm. argue that you know the case where a user aborts the download I, you know the other the other issue here that i have is sorry i'm jumping around but if the v if the export is a vm object and you captured that um i guess rerunning it um assuming the, the vm shouldn't have been restarted i'm just trying to think like that's kind of like a point in time on the vm that you captured and so like recreating it kind of feels dirty to me rather than just keeping it around. Um, yeah, but now the command is even potent, right? I can run it 10 times and it will behave the same. If I keep it around, then next time I start it, I'll get an error that already exists. And like, to me, this is cleaner. But... Oh, because the VM export download wouldn't like, the VM export download command creates the export and downloads it. It yes. doesn't just... Yes. Okay. It's 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 not like a. Okay. Um, yes, and there is an option, a flag you can set where you explicitly tell it, "No, I want to keep it around for whatever reason." Mm -hmm. But in general, it it's like an ephemeral type object. You know, you create it, you do your business, and then it, it gets cleaned up. So. Um, can we, and I guess we can't know at the time of creation how many volumes there would be. So we can't like reject it before doing any work. We actually have to do the the work and then we'll see it. Okay. Right. I mean, without without teaching vert CTL logic about like, because I guess vert CTL could look, I guess it doesn't really know which ones are, um, without a lot of duplicated business logic, it doesn't know, it couldn't detect this from just looking at the VM object. Right, that's the whole point of the VM export, you know, resource that it looks up all that stuff for you. And then for CTL mm -hmm. just, in, you know, looks at the at the resource and says, oh, right, this doesn't work, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so if you guys feel you want to close it, I would suggest maybe one of you guys go in and comment on that, like one of the feature authors. Um, okay, and, yeah, I can do it. Yeah, and if you just say that we think this is cleaner behavior because it keeps the command item potent, uh, you know, that's a, I think that's a pretty convincing argument. All right. Awesome, all right. And you know, there's an option to keep it around if they really want to, but there's there's no real benefit to it if you you know you find an error and you you run it again and uh, the resource already exists. I believe we throw an error saying that the uh, the expert already exists. I'm not 100 percent sure, but sure. No, I, I think suppose. I think if you created the VM export object uh, and then run virtual download VM export, it it will not complain if. Yeah, if it's already it, created, it, it, it will use the existing object. So right. it's it look, to me like it, it looks a bit not nice that you created the VM export and then you run the command and this command deleted your VM export. Like, uh, I, like I agree, but on the purpose of the VM export, the export object is the download, I guess. So once you finish downloading, um, like. I assume it will be good practice to garbage collect the resource. Yeah, but if but, the but, command didn't what? itself create it, 
it seems yeah this is a little more complex now to me yeah and and what if you created the vm export of snapshot it created another pvc but uh, the new vm export object may have may be different now after like mm -hmm. after some time yeah with a snapshot you're right yeah if the vm was running for example yeah that's yeah that's an important we should look at that use case really carefully because right if i'm let's say in the heat of the moment i've created a vm export because i saw something an anomaly in my virtual machine i'm thinking of like uh let's say you're a uh security department at a, a company and you detected an anomaly with the vm workload so you want to grab the uh the environment is close to the time that you detected the situation and then just because you fat fingered the command which i would do this i would totally not realize i had to specify a volume name and then it's deleted it and now by the time i can go back and recreate the vm snapshot now the environment inside of that vm has changed so i can't see what happened the the yeah. export command doesn't take snapshots though. So like presumably, you know, you you took a the snapshot will always exist. You can always okay. re-export it. Um, okay, as long as yeah, as long as we're not deleting a VM snapshot or like but, there wasn't like an implicitly created snapshot. I do agree though that we shouldn't delete things we don't create. Um. The only thing, the only time that gets weird is like, say, like, yeah, that, you know, you run that command once um, and it errors out so it doesn't delete it. Then you run it again and it downloads the thing and then it doesn't, then that second invocation doesn't delete it either because it didn't create it. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only time it gets weird. But I generally agree that you shouldn't delete things that you did not create. And it's the, the, there's not a flag dash dash delete. It's that's the implicit like uh, default behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if you had a dash, if you had a dash dash delete, then like they asked for it. So then it's clearer that we should try to delete it where if you didn't, then we could have some more like. Right. Only delete it if you created it. Something like that. Or if no dash dash delete, it'll just keep it around even if it yeah. The other thing you could do is have some output at the end of the command because these are intended to be like you use vert CTL for interactive flows, um, because you could just use the objects directly um if you were doing automated flows. So you could have a message at the end of the command that says um like if we're not deleting the object that says, you know, download completed, um, you know, to remove, uh, to, re to clean up, remove the whatever VM export resource. Um, like you could just have like a little notice like that it's being left behind and that if you want to delete it, type this essentially, or not, no. not necessarily type this, but like, um, you know, uh, the VM export resource, blah, 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 um, is being retained uh, to remove it. Or you could, I don't know, you guys can figure out the wording exactly. But to, to address Michael's um, use case where we're keeping one around that they may, like, it might be, it's good for people to understand, did we delete it or did we not? Yeah, it's kind of a weird situation. I think we could have a little more thought about it. I mean, in this case, if we leave it the way it is, it's the simplest. It's just we always delete it. Perhaps we may have wanted to have the, the default be to not delete it, but um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think there's a little more thinking needed on that one. Um, Alvaro, no, would you, would if, you... if we don't delete it, it will delete itself. I don't know. 
the pot will delete itself after what 12 hours something like that will it also delete the vm resource or the export resource i forget yeah, yeah, it has, it's, it... uh, two hours uh, default uh, TTL. Okay. So I think we'll forget. Yeah, so I think um, Alvaro, it would be great if you could take a look at some of these scenarios and maybe work with Jenny uh, because it seems she has some. Uh, some good thoughts on on that and maybe we could even update the test plan to define the scenarios that we're caring about and have it like yeah. update the update the our testing plan and have a couple of tests that we don't want to have a test to test if it sits for two hours and deletes obviously but like at least with a download failure like this one, let's define what the behavior should be. And if we decide that the behavior should be to retain it, then we need to define what the behavior is. Um, if you go back in with the correct option and it actually is successful, you know, per, per what Michael was talking about in that case, if we didn't create it, should we delete it or not? Like there's going to need to be some, discussion back and forth on the element of least surprise here for users. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And we even had some issues debugging flakes on this test uh, because the automatic delete. So yeah, uh, maybe it's a good idea to reconsider this behavior. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we're able to change the, uh, the defaults about you know, whether it, del you know, it used to delete by default, now it doesn't, and you have to specify the option. Um, if we even want to change that, like, yeah, there's going to need to be a little bit of discussion there to try to clean that up. Okay. Um, thanks for raising that one. Any other topics, issues, open floor items from anyone here today? Okay. All right. So I think we are finished with the agenda and we can end the call at this point. So thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you at the next one in about two weeks. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank